Good afternoon. This is the physics lecture for December 2nd, 2020 for cohort 12. This lecture is going to be resolving or revolving around sound and sound objects and application in physical therapy. Uh, it is asynchronous due to the fact that you will be on campus today to get your pictures taken and also for your intro to muscles lecture with Dr. Johnson. So let's get right into it. All right, so I got the application of sound lecture pulled up here. Let me make things a little bit out of the way. So the sound of sound, right? So we're going to talk about a couple of things here with sound of the human body, compressions or fractions, just the general application of sound, eventually get to the PT application of sound. So how does sound work? Well, let's say it's your favorite concert. For me, it'd be Slipknot, right? As the band plays music, electrical signals are going through their instruments, right? Going out to a speaker, being converted and everything like that. And it's going to cause speakers to push waves of pressure out from their baffles. Various compressed waves and non-compressed air are going to be received by your extra auditory meatus, your ear hole. And in that ear hole, it's going to go into your ear, causing your bones of hearing and the tympanic membrane to vibrate. Those vibrations that are going to be converted back into an electric signal that you interpret as sound. Or, you know, in the case of slipknot, some of you may think noise, right? All sound originates from the vibrations of materials and objects, right? Source of all sound is vibration, period. Piano, violin, guitar sounds produced by vibrating strings. In a sax, the reed vibrates. In a flute, the fluttering column of air and mouthpiece vibrates. Your voice, right? My voice right now, if I put my hand on my throat as I'm speaking, my voice results from the vibration of my vocal cords here in my throat. I can change my voice if I speak lower or higher. But all that is just nothing more than vibration of vocal cords, right? Even when we whisper vibration of vocal cords. All these sounds are received by your ear and transcribed by our vestibular cochlear nerves. In each case, the original vibration, where the sound's coming from, stimulates vibration of something larger or more massive. The sounding board of a stringed instrument is a great example. Air columns within the reed or an instrument. The air in the throat and the mouth of yourself, right, or a singer, is what causes that sound to go out to everyone else. The vibrating material then sends a disturbance through the surrounding medium, the air possibly, in the form of longitudinal waves. The frequency of sound waves produced equals the frequency of the vibrating source, right? We describe our subjective impression about the frequency of sound by the word pitch. So when you hear pitch, it's subjective. You have a high pitched sound like that from a piccolo has a really high vibration frequency. Low pitched sound like from a foghorn has a low vibration frequency. A young person like you guys can hear somewhere between 20 and 20,000 hertz. As we grow older, like I have, that frequency range has shrunk, right? It doesn't help that I probably have gone to a bunch of concerts and ruined my hearing. But just in general, just like everything else in our human body, as we age, our hearing kind of breaks down. Sound waves below 20 hertz are called infrasonic, below sound. Sound waves above 20,000 hertz are called ultrasonic. Excuse me. We'll soon talk about ultrasound in the PT world using either one megahertz or three megahertz frequencies. So that means those ultrasounds that we're going to be used in the clinic are operating at about a million hertz or three million hertz, right? And contrary to what Debbie at the clinic says, she cannot hear the ultrasound head operating. That is just way beyond human hearing. Right? We cannot hear infrasonic or ultrasonic waves. Right? Dogs can hear frequencies of 40,000 hertz or more. Right? That's where those dog whistles come in. And no, humans can't hear dog whistles. Bats hear sounds over 100,000 hertz because they operate via echolocation, much like dolphins. As the source of the sound vibrates, a series of compressions and rarefactions travel outward from the source. Compressions are area of high compression where fractions are the areas behind that area of high compression. So if you clap your hand like that, right, sound is going to go out in all the directions out there. Each particle is moving back and forth along the direction of an expanding wave. A compression travels along the spring, much like a sound wave would travel in the air. So we took a spring and you compress things. That's very much like sound wave traveling in the air. 
So think of this like opening and closing a door. If you have a door, a room that the window is open and the door is closed, right? When the door is open, a compression travels across the room. When the door is closed, a refraction travels across the room. For all wave motions, not the medium that travels across, but the pulse that travels. In both cases, pulses are going to travel from the door to the curtain. How do we know this? Well, the way the curtain moves based upon the way the door is open. If the door is open, the curtain is going to flutter outward. If the door is closed, the curtain is going to suck inward. That's an example of a compression versus a rarefaction. So if you quickly open the door, you can imagine the door pushing the molecules next to it into their neighbors, it pushes into their neighbors, it pushes into their neighbors, and eventually hits the curtain and blows it out, right? That is the idea of compression. When you quickly close the door, right, you create a kind of an area of low pressure or a vacuum next to the door. Those nearby molecules flow into it, leaving a zone of lower pressure behind them. And then those next molecules move in, they leave a little pressure behind them. Those next molecules move in, leave pressure below behind them. That area of low pressure is called the rarefaction. Not rarefaction, rarefaction. On a much more small scale, but also more rapid, this is what happens when a tuning fork is struck, right? So what did I just do with my tuning fork? Oh, there it is. It's like, where did I put my tuning fork, right? So when a tuning fork is struck, there are vibrations that are occurring in that tuning fork. Or when a speaker produces music, the vibration of the tuning fork and the waves it produces are considerably higher in frequency and lower in amplitude than the swinging door, right? If I crack this right now and I hold it over towards my window, my curtains aren't moving, right? That wave is too small to cause any major noticeable effect. So if we put the waves in a tube, right? So if we put this right next to a tube and we're able to look at the actual sound in the tube. When the prong swings away, sorry. So when it goes back this way, so when it swings, so if I, the tube is over here and it goes back away from the tube, it's creating an area of low pressure. That's gonna be the rarefaction. As it kind of bangs out towards the tube, it's gonna create an area of pressure called a compression. With sound itself, it travels in solids, liquids, and gases. But most sound we hear are transmitted through the air. If you put your ear to a metal fence and have a friend tap it far away, the sound is usually louder and faster in the metal than it is in the air. Why is that? Well, that's because the sound transmits a lot better. Take two rocks together and smash them together while your ears are smurred, you'll hear the sound pretty easily. But maybe take those same rocks and click them together farther away in air, you might not hear them. Solids and liquids are generally really good conductors of sound, right? But the speed of that is going to vary based upon the material that makes up that the, the liquid or the solid, right? So in general, sound is transmitted faster in liquids and gases and still faster in solids. So solids are usually the fastest. But in a vacuum, sound can't exist, right? We talked briefly about this in one of the previous lectures when I had mentioned about you know, Star Wars and Star Trek, those beautiful sci-fi shows, right? Or maybe you're more of a Battlestar Galactica or uh, uh, da, 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 why am I drawing a blank here? Stargate person. In those space battles, in reality, when those guns are going off and the ships are exploding, the people are screaming, right? Or somebody flies down the space and they're screaming, ah! Nope, there'd be no sound. They'd be on their eyeballs would blurst out of their face. That's by the point. It requires a medium to transmit sound, right? There may be vibrations, but if there's nothing to compress and expand, there can be no sound. So let's take the idea of a, an exploding ship in a space movie, right? As that ship explodes, it's going to create compressions going out from that ship explosion. If you were to be inside that ship when the explosion happens, yeah, you'd have a sound at that given moment. But once that ship has basically deteriorated into space, there's no sound because there's nothing to cause it to vibrate, right? The speed of sounding gas depends upon the temperature of the gas and the mass. So the speed of sounding material depends upon the material's elasticity. If you watch a distant person hammering, the sound of the blow takes time to reach your ears. So often you see the blow, right? The hammer comes down, boom, and then you hear it. You hear thunder after you've seen the lightning. Well, why is that? Because light travels much faster, much, much faster than sound. 
think of it this way. We've broken the sound barrier many times over at this point. We haven't even approached the light barrier yet. So speed of sound in dry air at zero degrees Celsius is about 330 meters per second or about 1200 kilometers per hour. That's about a millionth the speed of light, right? Increase temperatures, increase the speed slightly. Faster moving the molecules bump into them more often. For each degree increase in air temperature above it, the sound increases by about 60 meter, or 0.6 meters per second. So a good way to think of this, at least the way I learned it in physics, is for every 10 degrees warmer you are in the air, the, travel, the speed increases by about six meters per second. That will just made more sense to me. Now, you guys aren't going to have to memorize the specific changes in temperature, so don't freak out about that. But it's really interesting to think about. So that means if you have a thunder and lightning storm outside, right? If it is a warm summer day, the sound is going to reach you faster than maybe a winter storm because the temperature is different, right? Um, I was just out hiking in the, um, or is that the Madera Canyon down south of Tucson. When we were down there, it was like 32 degrees in the morning. And it was a lot quieter in the morning than as it warmed up. Well, two reasons. Number one, because obviously there were less people there in the morning, early in the morning, right? But number two, also the sound doesn't travel as well in those cold mornings. If you're a hunter, right? And I'm not saying any of you are, but if you are, you'll notice that if you go out, you know, usually when you go out hunting, you go out really early in the morning. When you get out there really early in the morning, it's often a very quiet, still morning as they call it, right? Well, why is that? Well, two reasons. Number one, not a lot's moving. And number two, at those colder temperatures in the morning, sound doesn't travel as fast. So maybe something a few miles away doesn't reach you as that quite, right? Uh, speed of mass, sound and mass, also, or gas also depends on the mass of the particles, right? So lighter particles like hydrogen molecules and helium move faster and transmit sound much more quickly <laughs> than oxygen and nitrogen. So speed of sound in solid materials depend upon its density and its elasticity. Right, elasticity is the ability to change shape in response. Steel, very elastic. This thing, pretty elastic, right? So it'll transmit sound a little bit better. Sound travels about 15 times faster in steel than air, and about four times faster in water than air. So when you have things like depth charges, great examples of weapons that use sound as an attack, right? A depth charge is basically a barrel that the ship drops into the water and that barrel will eventually explode. Now, two parts of that. They're hoping maybe that barrel, if they're taking on a submarine, they're hoping that barrel will sink and actually strike the submarine and explode on the submarine and cause damage that way. But the other thing is they know that in the water, sound is gonna travel out four times faster. And when that explosion occurs, it's gonna create a massive compression going outward. And even that massive compression going outward can cause concussive forces on not only the sub, but the people inside the sub as well. Because think about it, they're in a giant steel tube. So now the sound's just echoing inside that ship. So if the storm, you know, the three second delay between the lightning flash and the sound of thunder, you can actually calculate out about how far away it is. Usually a good, a good theory or a good rule of thumb is for every about three seconds that lightning it flash occurs to a thunderstorm, it's about a kilometer difference, right? So, you know, if you hear a thunder, you see the lightning, boom, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, sound is proper, the lightning strike was probably about two kilometers away, you know? And again, it varies, it depends on how warm it is out and how cold it is out. So sound intensity is objective, right? We talked about pitch being, subjective, but intensity is definitely objective, right? Loudness is a physiological sensation sense in the brain. So if something may be very loud to you, I may be very loud to you, but maybe not so loud to somebody else. And this, this comes into play. That is at a subjective sensation, a physiological sensation based upon the person, right? Some people definitely can't handle heavy metal music. For me, it's relaxing. The loudness for that to some people is just too much. But the intensity can be measured, right? The intensity of a sound is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the sound wave, right? Loudness, again, differs for people, but it is related to intensity. The unit of intensity of sound is the decibel, named after Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, right? 
Starting with zero at the threshold of normal hearing, an increase of every 10 decibels, meaning the sound intensity increases by a factor of 10. That means it is a logarithmic scale. A sound of 10 decibels is 10 times as intense as a sound of zero decibels. 20 decibels is not twice, but 10 times as intense as 10 decibels, or 100 times as intense as the threshold of hearing of zero decibels, right? So for every de the section you go up, it just gets more and more intense. Uh, 60 decibel sound is 100 times as intense as a 40 decibel sound. Most smartwatches nowadays have some form of measuring sound. I know my watch, my, my Apple watch, which is charging in my bedroom, does have it as well. And I usually keep that because maybe if I'm in an area where I know that I'm going to be in a lot of sound, I may want to protect my hearing. Because you only get one set of ears, folks, and one set of hearing bones. So this is kind of looking at a couple different sources of sound, right? Jet plane, right, at about 30, about 30 meters away. 140 decibels, 120 decibels for an air raid siren. Oh, God, that's a lot, right? Um, threshold of pain is 120 decibels. And we used to build, I used to, one of the things I used to do a long time ago and land far, far away when I was just a youngin, I used to compete competitively in uh, car sound competitions where we would see how much decibels you could cram into a car stereo. Now that I'm older, I'm a little smarter. I'm going, man, that was stupid. Um, because the car that I had designed back then, the stereo I designed back then, inside the interior of the car, I could hit 150 decibels. That's louder than a jet engine at 30 meters. And that's beyond the threshold of pain, right? You could actually physically feel the vibrations in your heart if I turn the music up loud enough in my car, right? So subway train, 100 decibels, average factory is about 90. Normal speech is about 60 decibels, right? Your average ordinary room sits somewhere around 30 decibels, 20 to 30 decibels with all the stuff going on in the room, right? So hearing damage itself begins at 85 decibels. The last Slipknot concert I was at, we were hitting 145 decibels. Ooh, that's bad. Right? That is beyond the level of hearing damage. And as I got older now, so I used to go to concerts all the time, but now as I get older, I realize, you know, I can't hear as well after I leave a concert. I start, you know, for a couple of days afterwards, if I don't wear earplugs, my ears ring for a couple of days. Well, why is that? Well, because I've gotten older, right? My ears just don't recover as well. A single sound can produce vibrations intense enough to tear apart the organ of corti, the receptor in the organ of the inner ear right? Less intense, but severe noise can interfere with cellular process in the organ, eventually causes breakdown. So it's not only a single exposure to a really loud noise, but it can also be caused by repetitive exposure to sub-damageable hearing. So, you know, in that 100 decibel range for a long period of time, you know, something like working on a factory floor or working on tractor trailer trucks. Unfortunately, the cells in the inner ear don't regenerate. You can noticeably help protect your hearing, can reduce noise with earplugs, usually by about 30 decibels. Now there are a bunch of really, really good earplugs on the market today, and those earplugs all can reduce those noises by various amounts. When any object composed of an elastic material is disturbed, it vibrates its own special set of frequencies, which provides its own special sound. If you drop a wrench and a baseball bat on the floor, you'll hear distinctively different sounds, right? The wrench is going to be kind of a tinny metal sound, whereas if you have a wooden baseball bat, it's going to be kind of a clunky sound. Objects vibrate differently when they strike the floor. What, what is that? Well, that's called the object's natural frequency, right? Tuning forks have a natural frequency that we actually can calculate out. So when we speak of that natural frequency, it's the frequency at which an object vibrates when it's disturbed. Even the human body has a natural frequency. Each organ has its own natural frequency. It depends upon the elasticity and the shape of the object. So that means that maybe bones will have a different, a different type of natural frequency than, say, a muscle. If you have a small bell, the pitch of it, right, the frequency of it is going to be a lot higher than that of a big bell. It rings at a higher pitch, right? So if you take something like a dinner bell, it's your ring, ding, 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 or the, oh my gosh, the Salvation Army bell, right? Everyone knows the Salvation Army bell sound. Why don't they ever change that? 
Well, it's because it's branding, right? They know you hear that specific sound from that Salvation Army bell, right? That you know you're looking for a Salvation Army person. So the natural frequency of the smaller bell is going to be higher. Let's say maybe something like a church bell. A uh, church bell has a very, very, very specific frequency and may ring over larger distances. Most things, planets, atoms, almost everything in between have a springiness and vibrate at one or more natural frequencies. Natural frequency is one at which minimum energy is required to produce vibrations and least amount of energy is required to continue this vibration. You may have seen somebody do this with a crystal glass, right, Mary, where they moisten their finger and they run it around the rim of the glass and eventually the glass starts singing. What you're doing is imparting the internal energy through friction going around the rim of the glass and it's reaching the point where that, that glass has it reaches natural vibration, starts to vibrate. So sounding board is an excellent example of this, right? They're part of the stringed instrument. When you look at the guitar, it's built and there's a box behind those guitar strings. And they're forced into vibration to produce sound. So if I take a tuning fork right now and I strike it out here, you may hear it, but it's definitely a low sound. Now, what happens if I take that same tuning fork and I lay it on my tabletop. Right? Can you guys hear the difference, right? Here's the tuning fork by itself. Now I put it on my desk, right? And I can even change how loud it is by putting on a different substance. So he, like I put on my coffee cup. Each of those makes a different sound as that, that tuning fork causes it to vibrate. The larger the surface area, the more air is set in motion, right? Your iPhone, right? Your iPhone has tiny itsy bitsy speakers in it down here, right? Well, how can you amplify that sound? Well, you can get a speaker, right? You can get a bigger speaker and amplify it that way. Or you could take something like a Pringles can and put the phone down inside of it and create a larger surface area to vibrate, which creates the noise, increases the decibel of that, of that sound going out, right? A forced vibration occurs when an object is made to vibrate by another object that's nearby. So if I take this, right? And I find a bony prominence, I can feel my bone vibrating, right? Because what's causing this, this tuning fork is causing my bone to vibrate. We use this in physical therapy quite frequently because we can do this. I can strike a tuning fork like that, right? stick it on a bone, and if that bone is fractured, all of a sudden it causes that fracture to kind of vibrate and it's gonna cause pain and you're gonna get punched by the patient. Not really, but that helps us maybe diagnose a fracture that might've been missed, right? So some patients coming in complaining, oh my God, man, right here, just on that palm, right? Where that handmaid is. Like, oh, it just hurts so bad, right? Every time I push up, it just hurts. And so you take out a good old tuning fork, yes, give it a good old whack, not the palm, but you give the tuning fork a whack and you put that tuning fork tip right down on that handmaid. And all of a sudden patients are like, holy God. Well, that forced vibration has caused that fracture that wasn't diagnosed to vibrate. And you can now say the patient's probably got a fracture, right? We use it to, there's actually a test called the patellar pelvic test where we can take a tuning fork like this, smack it, put it on the patella of a patient in hook line right? So where they're laying on their back and their knees are bent, that vibration is going to transmit down the femur and actually go into the pelvis and will cause them pain if they have a pelvic fracture. Actually rather ingenious, right? An object resonates when there's enough force to pull it back, start its position, enough energy to keep it vibrating. Again, tuning fork, little squishy ball, right? So again, tuning fork, I'm smack it, ding, touching the desk. You can hear the sound. Uh oh, no sound. Sound, no sound. Well, why is it? There's not enough energy in this tuning fork to cause the material in this to vibrate at a frequency you could hear. If the frequency of force vibration matches the object's natural frequency, resonance dramatically increases the amplitude, right? When you swing, it's an excellent example of natural frequency, right? You're gonna pump a swing in rhythm with the swing's natural motion. When you go forward, you're gonna kick your legs out. When you're going back, you pull your legs back. Timing is extremely important in order to get that swing to swing higher and higher, right? We used to, I, as a kid, I remember 
he's trying to swing the swing the whole way over the thing, right? And that was the stupidest idea in the whole wide world because we fall on our heads. But we did it as a kid because when we were a kid, we were invincible. If two tuning forks are adjusted to the same frequency, striking one fork will actually get the other fork to vibrate. So if I had two tuning forks at the exact same frequency, and I hit this one and I put it beside the other one, it will cause the other one to vibrate. Each compression of a sound wave gives the prong of the, tune, the just a tiny push, right? And that frequency will match the natural frequency of the fork. So it pushes the increase in the amplitude of the fork's vibration. The push occurs at the right time and are repeated in the same direction as the instantaneous motion of the fork. So here's an example of it, right? So the fork bends, fork returns to its initial position. That's kind of the way a tuning fork works. If the forks are not matched in frequency, so maybe, let's see, does this one have a frequency on it? What does this one say? Um, doo -doo -doo. I think this one is 50 hertz, if I remember correctly. It doesn't say on here. It should. That would make sense. So, you know, let's just say this was 40 hertz, and then I have a 60 hertz tuning fork, right? The pushes will be off and resonance won't occur. So, meaning if I push, hit this tuning fork, it's not necessarily going to cause the other one to vibrate. Tuning a radio is an excellent example of that, right? Inside the radio, there are piezoelectric crystals. Those piezoelectric crystals vibrate at a certain frequency. As you're tuning it and adjusting electricity going through that crystal, you're tuning into waves that are existing in the sound right now. Right now, all around us, right at this given moment, there are radio waves and television waves and microwaves and all kinds of other waves as well, right? That are all around us right now occurring. If you had the right frequency, and as a big joke is, you know, you go get dental work done and now you can pick up radio frequencies in your mouth, right? Theoretically, it's not that far off. If you had the right material in and that radio wave struck you at the exact moment, yeah, you could actually vibrate based upon that wave. So your antenna picks up a certain frequency, right? So comp 92.3, the rock station here in Las Vegas. We set the tuning to 92.3 megahertz. Once we have that tuning set to that, the crystal inside that radio is gonna vibrate at the frequency of the sound coming in via the antenna, right? The waves coming in via the antenna and we'll be able to get that radio station. Now, if some radio stations are really close, like 92.3 and 92.4, sometimes they overlap and you get that kind of bleed over. They're out of sync. So resonance occurs whenever successive impulses are applied to vibrating object in rhythm. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge is an excellent example of it. If you haven't heard about this, in Tacoma, there was a bridge that as wind was coming through, it caused the way the bridge to kind of sway back and forth and it ended up resonating with the natural frequency of the bridge. As it started resonating, the amplitude of the rocking and swaying got more and more and more. So the resonance started picking up and eventually the bridge collapsed, right? So it's kind of some pictures of it, right? You can see the bridge shaking back and forth. There it is up here in the upper right corner. It's kind of shaking back and forth and you can see it kind of waving, right? And then eventually, boom, boom, it's collapsing into the water. Now they've replaced that bridge since then, but still it just shows you that, you know, you can end up even causing something natural to have that weird effect where it gets resonance going. So when constructive interference occurs with sound wave, the listener hears a loud sound. When destructive interference occurs, the listener hears a fainter sound or no sound at all. Sound waves like any wave can made to interfere with each other. For a sound, the crest of the wave can occur, corresponds to the compression, the trough to the rarefaction. So when you look at a waveform, right, you see this. Mr. McKeever is a great drawer. This here would correspond to the compression. This here would correspond to the rarefaction, right, rarefaction. So we have those when the crest of one wave overlaps the crest of another wave. So they move in sync, there is constructive interference. So if two waves come in and they move in sync with each other, right? The impression of that is gonna be higher because they're gonna be moving in sync. 
if we change that up and now have a wave that goes like this, and instead our second wave moves an opposite phase of the sound, what will happen is we'll have what's called destructive interference. So instead of amping up the way we hear it, it'll tamp it down. So think of something like cars that advertise, you know, no road noise, no sound, no sound of the engine, stuff like that. Buick's an excellent example of it. They have a really great sound dampening system inside their cars. May not like Buick's as cars themselves, but inside they have a quiet ride technology. What they have is mini microphones all around the car that are picking up the road noise, that are picking up the ambient noise outside the car, that are picking up the engine noise. And even if the stereo is off, it's releasing a small amount of destructive interference that's, in, that's opposite and sync with that sound that's going on the outside and it makes the cabin quiet. It's actually really brilliant science. So constructive interference, the sound is heard louder. Destructive interference, sound is heard worse. It's or lower, or not at all, right? So say you're setting up a home stereo system. So let me get my little annotation up here. So here we have my TV, right? And of course, you know, if we have our TV, we got to have those fantastic sound systems. So here's our center speaker. Got some speakers here, right? Got some speakers back here. We've got our big honking subwoofer, right? So we've got all those. And now here I am sitting on my couch, right? As those speakers release sound, they're going to come out in waves. Oops, that's still line. I don't want that one. Hold on, erase that. The draw line. As these speakers release sounds, they're going to release sounds out in waves that are eventually going to get my ear. Right? These two speakers move in sync. Maybe this one has two speakers, so it's going to send out. It's going to send out. Right. What you hope when you set those speakers up is that all of these speakers are moving in sync at the exact spot I'm in. If I move even a meter to the right, it changes the way those sound waves hit me. And I can end up maybe hearing one speaker louder than another, or I could end up not hearing sound properly and it sounds quiet, right? That's why a lot of home theater systems come with an antenna that you put out before you start playing around with your stereo to match the sound to where you're gonna be normally sitting the most. Right? So let's say that, let me erase some stuff here. Erase, 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 erase. Let's say that maybe this speaker here is doing one of these, right? And instead this speaker over here is doing the opposite. They're gonna cancel each other out. I'm not going to hear anything. That's why there's a lot, there actually is a lot of science in setting up a home the a theater system, especially if you're doing something like a movie room or a media room or something like that. In those giant auditoriums where they have music, did you ever notice when you go into those auditoriums, there are some places where there are no chairs and it's not designated as a handicapped accessible area, right? Some of those, there's no chairs for a reason because that's where a wheelchair goes. But let's say you go there and there's no chair there and it's not designated as a handicapped accessible zone. Well, the reason why there might be that, that area without a chair is because in that area, the sound waves as they're banking all around the arena or all around the auditorium, they cancel each other out and you have a dead spot in the auditorium, right? You may have, some, you may have a favorite place you like to sit to watch TV in your room. It may be totally opposite of you know where you may want to sit in the room because you hear things a little bit better in that way. So when those wavelengths coincide with one another, you're gonna hear louder when you 
they counteract each other, you're going to hear it softer and you're going to have less of a sound. So there's kind of looking at what happens when you have waves that go in sync, right? So if you have two identical waves, the wavelengths increase. Here's it in the compressions, right? Here's what happens when they're moving in opposite sync, they cancel each other out. A listener equally distant from two sound speakers trigger an identical sound wave of constant frequency that hears a louder sound. The waves add together because the compression and refractions arrive in phase. If the distance between the two speakers and the listener differ by half the wavelength, the refractions from one speaker arrive at the same time as the compressions from the other and can cause destructive interference. That's why I said it's kind of important to set your system up based upon where you want to sit. Right, so waves arrive in phase, waves arrive out in phase over here in this picture on the side. So when you have two waves that come in together, they reinforce each other. If you have two waves that are out of sync with each other, they cancel each other. Destructive interference sound is usually not a problem. There's usually enough reflection of sound to fill in canceled spots. Um, do I, I don't have my headphones. Oh yeah, I do. Where are my headphones at? They're right here. So this pair of headphones that I have right here. Um, I went over the brand name. This is Sign Audio. So these headphones themselves are noise canceling headphones. I don't know if many of you have these, but I think the new Apple Pod Pros are this way. A couple of Samsungs are that way. How do they work? Well, they work just like I talked about with those cars. They have a microphone on them, right? If I pop these in and I turn the noise canceling on, everything around me goes dead. It's kind of wild, right? Now I can adjust that noise canceling, right? Most of them have a software that I can go in and adjust so that I'm not just sitting there going, huh, what? You know, it could be dangerous. What if I'm riding my motorcycle and I have my active noise canceling headphones in and now there's a fire truck behind me. I don't hear that fire truck. Um, the Beats have noise canceling headphones, Bose has, and Bose has had stuff like that for years, right? So that causes a destructive interference to block out all the outside noise. So the only thing you hear is the noise around you. Now, passive noise canceling is a little differently, right? I was talking about active noise canceling where it's got the microphone to hear the noise around you. Passive noise canceling is just where they put the plugs around the earphones, they slip in and they form a nice snug seal in your ear. So it doesn't let those outside waves come in that you only hear the inside waves, right? I talked about dead spots in theaters and gymnasiums already, right? The reflected sounds interfere with reflect unreflected to form zones of low amplitude. Theaters have that as well, right? Everyone always tries to sit towards the middle of the theater. It may not actually be the best seat in the house. There may be somewhere that's better. So that's why I suggest if you're going to the movie theaters, try sitting in different areas. Because maybe, you know, there might be a different area. In my studio here that I have set up, uh, my studio, it's my office, but it's my studio. Behind my computers, you can't see it. I'm not going to turn my camera around and show you it. But I've got specific material put on the walls that are designed to deaden the sound that I'm speaking, especially when I'm gaming because I tend to get a little bit, um, what's the proper term for it? Agitated would be a good term for it, right? And I don't want my neighbors losing their heads because I'm screaming at some idiot in Call of Duty, right? So I have my, my studio set up so that it's a little quieter. My new studio I'm setting up in Tucson is going to be a little bit even different. I'm actually trying to do the whole room that way. So that, you know, if I'm in streaming or I'm in doing work and I'm yelling at the computer, it stays inside that room so that I don't disturb everyone else in the household, you know, that would be bad. So destructive sound interference is used in anti-noise technology. Noise devices such as jack hammers have microphones and send out sound of the device to electronic microchips. Those microchips create a mirror wave and that are fed to your phones followed by the operator so that they don't go deaf from the jack hammer, right? So in some automobiles talked about noise detecting sounds, talked about that already, speakers can emit it, right? Cabins of airplanes are now quieted with the air noise technology or anti-noise technology, right? Have you ever noticed that once you get going in an airplane, it's pretty quiet? Well, that's because they're using this technology, right? Especially something like um, some of the like the air guitars and some like that, Saudi Airlines, they really have high-end noise technologies inside their cabins. When tones of slightly different frequencies are sounded together, the regular fluctuation in the loudness occurs, right? So those two tones, slightly different frequency are sounded together. The sound is loud, then faint, then loud, then faint, and then loud, then faint, right? Periodic variation of the loudness is called a beat, right? Beats can be heard when two slightly mismatched tuning forks are sounded together. 
you have periods where I'll be like, Ooh. all right. Chanting monks is an excellent example of the beat because sometimes when they're chanting, everyone matches tone and then sometimes it doesn't. So it gets louder and quieter and louder and quieter based upon the beat that they're humming at or chanting at. Can occur with any waveform and our practical way to compare frequencies. In order to tune a piano, a piano tuner listens for the beat produced between a standard tuning fork and a particular string on the piano. So you know, people that are piano tuners right, are really trained in listening for it. If the frequencies are identical, the beat will disappear. Right? So members of an orchestra tune up by listening for the beats between their instruments in a standard tone. I'm not very musical in nature. Um, I used to play the drums, so that doesn't count, in my opinion, as a musical instrument, I'm just saying, um, because a drum can overpower a lot of musical instruments, right? But a lot of times in warm up, each of the players in an orchestra are going to play a short tune a little bit so that everyone around them can get the idea of where their beat is so they fall in harmony. Otherwise, it can get really out of tune. Um, something like, you know, one of, one of my favorite mashups that happened a few years ago and it happened just this year is Metallica did a concert with the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. And I cannot imagine the amount of work that went into making a symphony orchestra match up with a heavy metal band so that the beats lined up. That had to be incredibly difficult for the conductor. And I, I mean, to me, that's amazing. Just as a music enthusiast, not as a player, right? Choirs often warm up together, right? They go through the scales in order to get themselves aligned with these others, their beats match up. The Doppler effect is a unique effect that occurs in sound as well, right? So the Doppler effect is change in frequency dependent upon movement or position of either the receiver or the producer, right? So in the sound wave, we hear this as a change of pitch. So if I take this tuning fork and I smack it right up here by the microphone, so cover your ears, it's gonna be a little loud. As I move it farther and closer to you, you may hear it waving back and forth. I can hear it in my ear. So I move it close, oh, it gets loud. And I move it away, it gets softer, right? That's the Doppler effect in sound. In the case of sound, we hear this as a change in pitch. In the case of movement, such as ocean waves, we may experience this an apparent change of speed, right? When waves come in and waves go out, you can sometimes get sucked out to the ocean by this Doppler effect. We can use this phenomenon to measure things like depth of a lake. We can send a sound wave down and see what it comes back at us like to measure things in that lake or to find things at the bottom of the ocean, right? Or in human terms, we can use it to determine the size, shape, and appearance of that, you know, parasite that grows inside mommy, the baby, because we use a Doppler ultrasound to look at baby. We can also use that to find the specific organs of baby. Think about how, like, exact of a science that has to be, that they use ultrasound to determine if the baby's heart is healthy or if the baby's heart is not healthy. The Doppler effect can also occur in light, right? Increases in light frequency when light sources approach you, decreases in light frequency when light sources move away from you, right? So a great example of a Doppler effect is if you watch a car coming at you, right? You can see the headlights far off. As they get closer and closer and closer, those headlights get brighter, right? And as the car moves away from you, you can see the taillights in the bright red. And then as they move further and further away, that light gets lighter and lighter. So the decreases in light frequency as it moves away is a great example of the Doppler effect. Um, star spin shape can be determined by shift in movement, right? We'll talk about that with stars as well. So when we talk about the stars, we have this called blue shift and red shift. The blue shift is an increase of frequency towards the blue end of the spectrum or red shift towards the red end of the spectrum. When a star spins, right? shows a red shift on the side facing away from us and a blue shift on the side facing us. We look up into the stars at night, we see them as white, right? But in reality, they're kind of bluish, right? They're on that end of the spectrum, the white blue end of the spectrum. Our sun's a little different, right? Our sun shows up as yellow. Well, why does it show up as yellow? What well, really shows up as yellow because of our atmosphere, right? So that's kind of the Doppler effect with light. And we'll talk about that when we get to light. Shock waves are a pattern of overlapping spheres that form a cone from objects traveling at speeds faster than the speed of sound, right? Consists of two cones, the area of high pressure generated in the bow of a supersonic aircraft and the area of low pressure that follows it behind the tail, right? 
it's not required that the plane actually be noisy in order to have a shockwave. Most planes that travel at supersonic speeds actually are quiet, right? The, um, the Concorde, I don't even know if it's still in operation anymore, I have to look. But as this plane travels through the air, right? So what's happening is this plane is traveling so fast, it's breaking the sound barrier. It's traveling so fast that the compressions or rare fractions can't keep up. So around the plane, we have an area of really high pressure. But behind it, there's nothing. There's almost a vacuum. So what happens is, as that plane goes by, these waves come crashing in. And it creates a sonic boom, right? So as it goes out, it's like it travels along and boom, 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 down behind it. It's not the plane making the noise. It's the air collapsing behind the plane and coming back together from an area of extreme rarefaction, right? This is why they can't travel at supersonic speeds over cities. Because if they break the sound barrier over cities, as that sonic boom collapses, it's gonna create enough of a compression going outward then that it's going to cause windows to break, right? It'll cause maybe some windows to operate at their natural frequency that they vibrate and shatter. Right? So it's not good for planes to do supersonic flyovers right over the top of a city. Now, can they do them at high altitudes? Sure. Right. Now, let's say you go on and get on a Southwest plane. And you're like, oh, I'm going to fly Southwest to San Diego. Southwest does not operate at supersonic speeds. Number one, the Gs you pull at supersonic speeds would not be comfortable in a 737B. Right. Number two, you don't have a suit designed to keep that pressure off of you. And number three, yeah, Southwest falls apart sometimes at normal speeds. We don't want them at supersonic speeds. But think about what would happen if we could develop the ability to have, you know, um, retail passenger car, you know, planes that we could travel across the country at supersonic speeds and that were efficient and that could, you know, maybe not use as much fossil fuel like I talked about last time. The actual ability to move cargo and people across the country would be amazing, right? Bullets are an excellent example of this. You can actually get a supersonic bullet. And when you're trained in shooting, let's say I'm, I'm on the end of a valley and somebody's shooting at me, right? Oftentimes, the bullet's going to strike before I hear it. And so I've got to learn how to track where that sound came from so I can figure out where that person is. Right? But a supersonic bullet throws that off because now it's traveling at faster than the speed. Crack of a circus whip is an excellent example. When you whip that circus whip, snap it back and forth, right? as it cracks, what it's doing is it's creating an extreme area of compression in front of it. And then it pulls away and then it creates a void. And that area of that void now sucks in that compression and you get that snap. Right, Even when you do something like this, right, what you're doing is as I'm snapping, I'm creating an area of high pressure and then pulling it away, creating an area of low pressure. And the sound is rushing in and causing that crack to occur. So how does this all apply to physical therapy? Well, we use sound in a variety of different ways in physical therapy, primarily in ultrasound, right? Ultrasound uses all the concept of sounds to do both thermal and non-thermal effects on the body, right? When we talk about ultrasound, depth of penetration, meaning how far an ultrasound goes into the body, is inversely proportional to the frequency. Meaning as frequency goes up, depth of penetration goes down. As frequency goes down, depth of penetration goes up. The lower in frequency the ultrasound, the deeper the tissue penetration. One megahertz goes deeper than 3.3 megahertz. The most two common frequencies used in ultrasound are one and 3.3 or three megahertz. Rarely do you see a two megahertz or three megahertz machines, but they do exist, right? 3.3 megahertz machine penetrates about five centimeters deep. A one megahertz machine penetrates about one centimeter deep. Actually reverse that, I've got to fix that. Oh, how did I mess that up? Good job, Mr. McKeever. Switch these. Right? So the 3.3 three goes a shallower area. The 1 megahertz goes deeper. I'll fix that before I post this lecture. So that's, that's totally wrong. I apologize. I 
was typing that must have not paid attention to what I was typing. So I apologize. The one megahertz goes deeper. The three megahertz goes shallower. I will get that corrected. I'm on nincompoop. Sorry. Do you see even I make mistakes? So then we talk about thermal effects or non-thermal effects of ultrasound. Well, how do we create a thermal effect versus a non-thermal effect? Well, there are two duty cycles in ultrasound. The duty cycles are continuous and pulsed. A continuous ultrasound will have a greater ability of warming the tissue, right? So like the 3.3 only penetrates about one fifth as far as that one megahertz, but it has four times the heating potential because it's operating at a faster frequency. Pulsed ultrasound is typically this is percentage of beam function. So 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. The lower the percentage, the lower the thermal effects. So a continuous ultrasound. When you have a continuous ultrasound, the ultrasound head is on at all times. That means those sound waves are flowing constantly. If you have something like a 20% pulsed ultrasound, that means that if you take and you measure 10 seconds of time, the ultrasound head's on for about two total seconds and then eight seconds is gonna be off, right? So that means less sound waves are penetrating the body, which means less reaction to those sound waves, which means less of a thermal effect, right? And we may use those different ways. You know, we use pulsed a lot for healing, for creating a, a healing effect on stuff like bone and tendon, whereas heating can be really useful on muscles that are tight or tender. The intensity of the ultrasound is measured in watts per centimeter squared versus the intensity of sound being measured in decibels. But you really can think about them pretty similar. So watts per centimeter squared is how much energy is being delivered to the body by those waves. The most common intensity you're gonna see in the clinic is 1.8 watts per centimeter squared. And you might ask me, Mr. McKeever, why do we use 1.8 watts per centimeter squared? And I'm gonna tell you, I have no idea. No one seems to know where this came from. We will teach you in modalities that are there are specific intensities to use for specific conditions and specific areas of the body. But for some reason, someone in the clinic once said that 1.8 watts per centimeter squared is what we should use for ultrasound. And everyone just kind of stuck to it. And no one questioned, well, why is that? And so a lot of times when you go out in the clinic, and you, it, for those of you that are techs will tell me, if I talk, I just went through a bunch of stuff on ultrasound, probably you're all like, I have no idea. I've never taught any of this. I just go and turn the machine on and move the head around. This is the difference between a tech and a PTA. Is you are going to be expected to know the specific differences between different ultrasound, not only heads, but you know, megahertz frequencies, continuous versus non-continuous intensities. It's all gonna be important to you because it's all going to affect the outcomes you get with your patients. If you don't pay attention to that, you will have a negative outcome. So ultrasound can be used for stuff like tissue shortening, pain control, ulcers, skin injuries. Tendon injuries, bone fractures, phonophoresis, which sound delivery of medications, phoresis, transdermal delivery of medication, reabsorption of calcium deposits in maybe the bones or the muscles, plantar warts, herpes zoster can be used, and I don't highly recommend that. And I have to look, I think that might now be a contraindication, but I know we used to use it for that. And the only reason I say it might be a contraindication is because we know that herpes zoster is a viral infection, and that if we provide ultrasound to it, then we're actually providing energy to the viral infection and may spread the viral infection. Contraindications, malignant tumors. We're not gonna do ultrasound over malignant tumors because we're providing energy to a cancerous region, which will cause it to grow worse. Um, not over certain tissues, right? We're not gonna do it over baby in the pregnant uterus, not over the spine or the brain, not over the eyes. Oh my God, I actually had somebody once that tried to do that. The patient had a pain above their eyebrow. I'm like, can I do ultrasound on the eye? No, you can't, stop it. Um, not over reproductive organs. It's not terminal, but you know it's not good. Uh, joint cement, we don't want to do it over because we can cause a joint cement to break apart. Plastic hardware pacemakers and thrombophlebitis as well are some contraindications. Definitely pacemaker. Think about that. Do you want to sound sound waves into a device keeping somebody's heart running? Definitely not a good idea, right? So we use sound that way. I told you we use tuning forks in physical therapy to detect fractures. We can also use it. If you ever get a tuning fork, you can take it. If you ever want to hear something funny, take the tuning fork, go back here, find your mastoid process and see how loud it gets in your ear, right? Because you can sound, that sound transmits via bone very effectively. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen, but there are new headphones out now that are called bone conduction headphones. And they actually are designed to sit on the bony prominences of your head 
and send the sound into your head via the bunny promises, leaving your ears open to hear things. It's a neat technology, don't really care for it yet. Um, I don't think they sound the same as regular headphones quite yet, but maybe that might be in the future, right? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Was there something else I want to cover? Oh, last thing, kind of that plays into play with this, right, in your home. I'm sure all of you have Wi-Fi devices in your home or routers, right? So how many of you have routers? Raise your hand right now. Oh, that's right, I don't have a class, this is asynchronous. But all of you probably have a router sitting around your house right now. Right? So the router is what's going to allow you to connect multiple devices to your network. Most of those routers will have two different frequencies on them. Right? They're going to have a 2.4 and a 5.0 gigahertz frequency. That's a Z. Right? Why is this important to know? Well, because this can affect your ability to actually have a good solid Wi-Fi connection in certain parts of your house. So using what we learned about ultrasound, right? So think about this. With, you can think that the, the 2.0 or 2.4 one here, right? Is gonna travel something like this. This five gigahertz frequency is actually traveling double the wavelength. So for every one of these waves, there are almost two of these waves. Why is that important? Well, the five gigahertz is gonna transmit data a lot faster because it's got more throughput, right? Think about that. This, the speed of the waves bouncing back and forth are gonna be faster. That's fantastic, your speed goes up. The downside is just like we learned with ultrasound, depth of penetration is worse. As the frequency goes up, depth of penetration goes down. So let's say you have a house or apartment like mine is right now. My apartment is like, 60 feet of solid concrete. I'm not joking, like every part of the wall in my house, my apartment is a retaining wall. Everything is solid concrete. I learned that one day when I got mad and I punched the wall. Don't punch concrete, it hurts. It may even megahertz. <laughs> anyway, or gigahertz at that point. So what's the problem with that? Well, my router is located here in my office, right? My, I have a PlayStation here, I have an Xbox, I have all my consoles in here as well. But out in my living room, I have my big old honking 75 inch television. And sometimes I just like to play on that versus playing on my, you know, 30, my 332s in here. Sometimes I just wanna go out there, it's a good 4K monitor or 4K TV and I just wanna hang out and play games with my friends. Or maybe, you know, I have a bunch of friends over and we're gonna do a Mario party on, um, not a Mario party, but um, Super Smash Brothers party. It's a lot easier to crowd them around a 75 inch TV versus crowding them around a 32 inch monitor, right? Or even 332 inch plus my 55 TV. So most of my house used to be connected via Wi Fi. Well, my five gigahertz router, when it was sending out to that area, I'd get a really weak signal because my walls are all concrete, it didn't penetrate very well. You know, I could get fairly decent speeds, but it would drop every now and then. So I wouldn't have a really good consistent connection. Now I could switch to my two gigahertz and I'd get a better connection. My, I wouldn't drop as many packets. Things wouldn't cause any problems. But the downside to that was I wasn't able to get as much speed, right? Because, well, that makes sense that it's traveling a lot slower. So I lose some of my speed, but what I sacrificed in speed, I made up in quality which can be really big for some of you people that are right now that may be having trouble with your Zoom calls where you're maybe in your room and the router is a couple of rooms away. Well, what the problem is, is it's trying to penetrate those walls and it's just not getting there. So what could you do? Well, you can remove your router, that works, right? Or you can try swapping to the bandwidth that actually travels a little further. Now, some of us don't have that option. Some routers automatically choose whether you're on the two or the four. Mine doesn't, the one that I have. Mine, I have one, my one bandwidth is set to one thing and the other bandwidth is set to the other. And I have specific names for them. So I know which is which. You may try that at home if you're having problems with your Wi-Fi connection in your bedrooms or something like that. Try switching bands and see, you know, because five doesn't always mean better. Five may mean better in speed, but maybe worse in dropping things and not being able to send stuff all the time, right? Now, the ultimate way to do it is exactly what I did. And I ran cable throughout my whole house. So I've got my whole house is wired at this point rather than wireless. I mean, I still have wireless for like my phone 
in my iPad and stuff like that. But most of my house is operated on a wired connection because wired is still superior to everything can get wirelessly. There's just not an effectiveness of that. So that brings us back to cell phones, right? Do you hear about 5G and 4G and 3G and all that fun stuff, 1X, right? Well, it's not the same as gigahertz. So it's not like they're saying 5G being five gigahertz. 5G is fifth gen wireless. So let's think about that. Why do you think when we talk about something, let me erase here, uh, clear all, clear all drawings. So now we've got someone to come along. It's, let's say is we got, well, I don't want the eraser, I want the draw. There we go. So we got Verizon coming on. Verizon comes along and says they've got two different new things. They've got 5G and then they've got 5G ultra, oops, U, ultra wideband. That's a B. I promise that's a B. Wow, that looks really bad. Let me erase that. You never saw that. Ultra wideband, right? So what does this mean? Does it mean it's five gigahertz? No, what it means is it's fifth gen wireless. And as we move forward in wireless signals, what's happening is those, those wavelengths are getting closer and closer together. They're traveling at much more rapid speeds, right? That really pushes that bandwidth really fast. That means you can get higher speeds. The downside to that is you go in Costco and you have no service. Or maybe suddenly you're on like 3G. Do you ever notice that when you go in Costco or Sam's Club that sometimes you just don't have service hardly at all, especially if you have something like Sprint or T-Mobile, sometimes that happens because the way their bandwidth operates, they're at a higher bandwidth. That means it doesn't penetrate those big old conk and stores as well. Ultra wideband, all that really means is we've got not only that speed now, but lots of antennas to receive that signal coming back from you. So that gives you really, really fantastic speeds. Um, Phoenix, for example, has 5G ultra wideband. I've got a friend who's a Verizon technician down there and he can get 50 gigabit per second on his phone, which absolutely destroys anything you can get for a home network connection right now. The downside to that is it's via wireless transmission. So there are a couple downsides to that. Number one, you know, what happens if something interrupts that signal, right? So maybe for whatever reason it can happen, a bird flies through the signal. That can affect your signal quality, right? And you can end up with packets being dropped, which is a totally different IT thing. We're not going to talk about that right now. The other downside to that is if you operate solely on a wireless network and totally wireless, that's going through the air out to the towers, which means people can sniff it, meaning they can actually leach into your network. Even if they say it's the most secure, there are people that can leach into those networks. Every year here in Vegas, there is a hackers convention called DEF CON that comes in. And DEF CON, when you walk into the convention, one of the things it says is, there's usually a sign that says, if you value the data on any of your electronic devices, now is the time to turn it off. It may already be too late. Now, this is an ethical hacking convention, meaning these are people that are designed, these are hackers that fight hackers, right? But if you have a constantly on signal, your phone is constantly on and sending stuff up and down to the cloud, right? My, your, if you have something like the iCloud on your phone, it's constantly syncing up and down to the cloud, up and down to the cloud. So that means data is moving all the time. If somebody is smart enough, they can grab that data as it's moving, right? You've heard about celebrities having their phones hacked and having photos they don't want photos taken, right? Or stolen. Well, if you don't want those photos out in the media, don't share them or don't post them to your social media and stuff like that as well. Um, 5G ultra wideband may eventually replace the home internet services, which may, my, my main thing is, is if they can actually come out with this and it reduces the cost of my Cox service, I'd actually be extremely happy with Verizon at that given moment. If it forces Cox to be a little bit more competitive. Right? But nothing will ever really replace the speed. Like you're not going to see major corporations, you're not going to see Pima go to an all 5G network. It's not going to happen because wired is still faster in the long run and more stable and more secure. I can secure my wired network a lot better than I can secure my wireless network. But it's pretty cool technology that's out there. And all that operates on is sound. That's literally what it operates on is the theory of sound. Because again, the faster the wavelength, the faster you can move data, but the less it's going to penetrate stuff. So I hope that you guys learned something from this lesson. I mean, it was kind of a, 
a little geeky there towards the end. This, the, you know, when I get to this type of science here, I really enjoy that. And there are some review questions for you, obviously. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here so I can talk directly at you guys. But it's really neat. And so this is the thing is, you know, if, you, if you're having problems at home, uh, I just helped a couple of people at the other cohort with network connections, right? If you're having these problems at home where, you know, you're not getting a stable connection and maybe while you're on a Zoom call, your picture's blinking in and out. Or are you doing one of those when you're on Zoom calls? It may be the bandwidth you're operating on. And it may be time to look at maybe going, okay, well, maybe I need to be on the two gigahertz bandwidth instead of the five gigahertz bandwidth. Try it. What's the worst that can happen? It slows down your connection and you don't get any better. Oh, well, right? You may need to move to a wired connection in that room. You may have to run a Cat5 cable all the way. To, I don't know. Or you may just need to operate better in the room that's actually in the room with your router. That can help all of that. But sound itself is how all of that operates. It's all operating on that sound wave principle. And to me, that is amazingly just fantastic, right? The, the, the application of sound just in general in physics is just fascinating to me because there's lots of things we can do with sound that you know, cause different problems. Now, last thing I'll talk about sound before I let you go, let's talk about concussions for just a brief moment. Right, because you're going to see this in military members. You know, military members may come back and they may have had what's called a, con a concussive blast injury. And we talked about those with the, the concussive blast with the um, the supersonic airplane. We can get a concussive blast just from a bomb. So maybe you're not hit by that bomb, that IED, but that bomb went off close to you. And when that bomb goes off, it's going to create an area of extreme area. So this is my bomb. It's going to create an area of extreme compression coming out from it. Those waves are going to eventually hit you, and they're going to pass through you. Depending upon how much that pressure is, you can burst an eardrum, right? There can be other problems too, but it can travel into your head and can literally scramble your brain. And it's really common for people that have you know, military members that end up with a near close blast effect for them to have problems where they have problems with thinking, problems with coordination, problems with comprehension for a while afterwards, because what they've gotten at that point is a compressive concussion, right? Where their brain has literally been kind of scrambled by that explosion. It's no different than somebody coming up and smacking them upside the head with a baseball bat. Right? The baseball bat's doing the same thing. The baseball bat's going to create an area of compression here that forces the brain to go this way. That shock wave coming in is doing the same thing and may actually be worse because the baseball bat's only going to hit bone and send a you know, force effect. That concussive shock wave is actually going to penetrate through the bone and be able to move through the whole tissue of the brain. And it can cause long-term pruning effects in the brain where they may actually have brain damage from a concussion blast. And so we'll talk about that in neuro, talking about how you treat patients that may have concussive blast injuries. But just think about that for a second, right? So this is literally, you know, I mean, this is not Uncle Jim Bob with his firework, right? And that goes off, right? That can cause a problem. Um, any of you go that go shooting, one of the things you need to make sure you're wearing when you're out shooting is ear protection. Because the sound of those bullets going off creates, a, not, I'm not talking a little 22s, pop, 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 that doesn't really count. But you're shooting something like a 30 out six, a 300 Weatherby, a 3030, a shotgun. The concussive blast of sound that comes out of that gun can cause long term hearing damage, right? So you've got to protect your ears. If you shoot something like a BMG 50, which is a 50 caliber sniper rifle, the sound wave from that can rupture eardrums. That's why a lot of times they had designed that the sound wave comes out of the front instead of coming back towards the shooter. Because if it didn't, that sound wave could literally, you know, you may not be able to hear the next person beside you, right? Um, the big belt fed machine guns, uh, like you see Rambo using all the time, right? The big 50 caliber, you know, belt fed chain machine guns. What I always liked is in one of the movies, he's shooting that thing, blah, 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 shooting around, and then he holds a conversation completely normal afterwards. That wouldn't happen. That gun has no sound dampening er, mechanism. So as that gun's going off, all that sound is going into his ears and he's going to be deaf for a while, right? 
and maybe even have permanent hearing damage, maybe brain damage. It could, you know, theoretically, you could get a concussion from shooting a gun, I guess. Um, especially if you let that gun shoot back at your face, right? If you haven't seen that, Google people shooting a 50 caliber hand cannon and watch them hit themselves in the head with a gun. It's kind of funny. But that just goes to show that even you guys have to protect your hearing. So, you know, when you're working with patients that are hard of hearing, understand that there could be a lifetime of reasons why they're hard of hearing. It can also just be natural, right? So what can, what can you do to help a patient that's hard of hearing? Well, first of all, you can increase the volume, right? Increase the decibels of your voice. That may not be the problem. The problem may be your pitch, right? Your frequency, where instead of talking in your normal, you may have to drop down an octave or two or raise up an octave or two so they can hear you. So just think about that when you're working with a patient that's hard of hearing in the future is that, well, maybe the problem isn't necessarily the structures, they just have damage and long-term effects from their hearing, right? Um, that's it for today. I hope that you guys found this lecture kind of enjoying. I actually like this lecture. We're going to do a light lecture next, I believe. And I like that lecture too. This kind of gets more into the application of stuff to physical therapy. And so with that, I'm going to check on out. I hope you guys have a great day and I will catch you on the next lesson.